Hi everybody, welcome back to English 229. This is for our class for Monday, the 23rd. So I am hopeful that at this point you have finished reading Frankenstein. We began our Frankenstein unit by watching the very iconic 1930s film, which is quite different, obviously, than the text that Mary Shelley wrote. And we spent some time last class talking a little bit about some of the themes of the text. And we also started talking about some of the actual chapters. And I wanted to finish up talking about some of the chapters today. And then we could put some closure onto Frankenstein next class. And if you can see in the notes below, I have included the links to the Edgar Allan Poe stories, which we will be reading after Frankenstein. And next class, I will also be introducing links to the next reading. And as you know, at this point in the semester, I've distributed the paper topic. And that said, you can certainly come up with your own paper topic. Just make sure that you get it approved by me. But I was inspired by Emily Dickinson's quote, one need not be a chamber to be haunted. And certainly we can see that in our first Gothic text. I suggest we'll, we'll be able to see that in all of our Gothic texts. When we were talking a bit about Victor Frankenstein and his hubris, we also were talking a bit about Victor and his motivation for creating life from death. And one would seem to think that the loss of his mother is a major impetus for that. We could say that he's haunted by that loss of his mother. And certainly we know that as the text progresses, what we end up getting is a creature who's not at all like the Hollywood version, but a creature that's very thoughtful and that's very articulate and that's very, in many respects, benevolent, at least initially, which is where I, I left off last class. And one could say that the creature himself is quite haunted by the fact that first, He's rejected by his creator. And then secondly, that ultimately he's rejected by humanity as a whole. And last class, I talked a little bit about chapter nine where we get the creature story. But of course, the creature story is embedded within multiple narratives. And that is one of the major challenges of the text is the unreliability of narrator because ultimately Victor is giving the creature story, but ultimately it's Walton, never appears in the film, who is giving us Victor's, who's giving us the creature story. Now, we had talked a little bit about the Gothic and doubling, maybe even tripling. I mean, certainly Walton and Victor share many commonalities, and certainly Victor and the creature share many commonalities as well. But I think we'll see that in chapter nine, if we are going to assume that we can rely on the narration, what we have is a creature that appreciates nature, that engages in benevolent activities. Um, time after time after the creature is rejected, his first impulse is to do good. And as the creature discusses, he's learned how to do evil because of mankind. If you're a Shakespeare fan, you might be familiar with the play called The Tempest, known as Shakespeare's last play. There's a character there by the name of Caliban, who's supposed to be this uh, deformed monstrosity who is the basically um, the offspring of a witch. And one of the things that Caliban talks about is that he learned ultimately how to curse after his island was uh, invaded, in effect, by Europeans. Um, it's one of Shakespeare's more interesting plays, particularly if you wanted to talk about colonialism and some of the critiques associated with colonialism. But nevertheless, I, I always think of Caliban when I, I'm reading the creature story and the story is a complex narrative about the de lacy family which again would never appear in the hollywood film version of frankenstein 
And the fact that the patriarch of the family is blind is particularly important because the creature is rejected for its hideous physical appearance. And certainly we can see modern day parallels with things like racism and sexism and classism that ultimately judgments are made based on exteriors and that said it makes frankenstein a very progressive text in in many respects the uh, discrimination and alienation that the creature feature of of faces because of its features and the blind, the lacy, cannot see. So when the creature ultimately tries to um, befriend the de Lacy family through the patriarch, it seems like there is an opportunity for connection. Of course, and I hope you've gotten this far in the text, um, the other members of the de Lacy family come and see the creature's hideous appearance and, of course, chase the creature away. And after this incident, and an incident where he tries to save a drowning girl and is rewarded for his efforts by being shot at, slightly different interpretation in the film where he befriends a girl and they begin playing. And after throwing flower petals into the water, the creature throws the girl into the water, not realizing there's a distinction. But in both instances, what we see is a certain level of um, innocence from the creature. And it's only after the creature is once again um, neglected and rejected that it, it decides it's going to enact its revenge. Not that we could ever justify the idea of murder, but again, another modern day parallel is that what happens with the very old debate of nature versus nurture and how does one's environment shape one's upbringing and one's personality and how much are they to blame for exterior factors? Of course, eventually we need to take responsibility for our own actions, but the narrative of the abandoned child or the abused child and the consequences thereof is one that continues to this day. So even though there are problems with some of Mary Shelley's writing, one of my favorites being, of course, that the creature is able to teach itself language and how to read and write. And it also finds a satchel of books. But besides that, I think that Mary Shelley's text holds up quite well, particularly in regards to some of the major scientific questions of our time. Or as I'm fond of saying, just because you can, that doesn't necessarily mean you should. And just because Victor has the ability to ultimately create life from death, we see that he should not have done that. He was basically usurping the role of God, the Prometheus idea that we were talking about last class, and the consequences are significant. But perhaps even worse is that Victor negates his entire responsibility to his creation and abandons it. So what the creature experiences is episode after episode of being abandoned. And the De Lacy narrative is somewhat complex that they uh, um, had experienced exile because one member of the De Lacy family, Felix, had stood up against some injustice and he was trying to protect an individual who was unjailed fairly and they ended up making a pact that if Victor could save um, this individual, then Victor would be rewarded with the individual's daughter. Think about the idea of child as possession. And this goes all the way back to Victor talking about that he was there's Clarence play thing. And certainly we see how female is viewed as possession. We're talking about Elizabeth and how Victor seems to treat Elizabeth as his possession. But he does so as well with the creature until he abandons it. And, of course, it turns out that Felix is betrayed. And this is where we get some subtext about Mary Shelley, where we see that perhaps she's not as progressive as we would like her to be. There definitely is a ethnocentric bias in her writing. There definitely is a Christian bias in her writing um, because the daughter is the daughter of an Arab and the father is horrified over the idea that Felix a Christian would be 
betrothed to his daughter. So it, it was all a lie. And what we do get is some rather interesting commentary in chapter 14 about Safi's mother, who's a Christian Arab, who basically taught Safi to aspire to the higher powers of intellect and independence of spirit forbidden to the female followers of Muhammad. So as restrictive as Christianity might be for female during this time period, definitely the message that Shelley is embedding within the text is that it was even more restrictive in the non-Christian world. What we see in Safi is a rather independent female, which might raise some eyebrows considering the fact that we oftentimes get very passive females in this text. And I had argued that this is perhaps Mary Shelley's way of showing us what happens in a male-centric world when female is ostracized and is basically rejected. And there are obviously negative consequences to that. But keep in mind that Safi ultimately decides to disobey her father, even though he, in chapter 14, loathed the idea that his daughter should be united to a Christian, and decides to set out on her own, defy her father. She doesn't know the language, she doesn't know the land, and she's able to find the De Lacy family, who, of course, has been exiled by this point by the government they used to live a rather comfortable lifestyle and now they're living a rather poverty um uh or they're living a life of poverty at least compared to the life that they had before and safi finds the family and ultimately the family welcomes her and also teaches her english so this is how the creature is able to learn english by observing all of this and the creature notes you know in chapter 13 was man indeed at once so powerful and so virtuous and magnificent yet could man also be so vicious and base the answer is yes both are possible as we see even in contemporary times but certainly within this particular narrative I think it's quite interesting that the creature indicates that he finds out about its origin um, because he discovers some papers in the pocket of a lab coat that he had taken from the laboratory of Felix's lab coat. And again, this goes back to the idea of so much of this narrative being told through letters, the epistolary novel technique, which was common at the time, but also it complicates the narrative. While certainly it can give a certain level of validity because there is documentation, if we're getting the narrative only from one individual, in this instance, Walton, then we must wonder about the veracity of the rest of the narrative, which is what today's attendance question is going to be about. Again, I wanted to ask a question that wouldn't necessarily have required you to finish reading the novel in its entirety, though I'm hopeful that you've done that and you've moved on to Poe. Today's attendance question will be about whether you liked or disliked the epistolary novel technique, which is quite easy to forget once we get embedded within these narratives. It's only until we get to the ending of the novel that we return back to Walton and his letter writing. Note how many times Victor says things like he says in chapter 19, I felt as if I had committed some great crime. And then he dares to say I was guiltless and I would say he's anything but. Um, and those are the consequences that he's going to have to address that he comes close, but he never quite embraces his responsibility. Think about when the creature says in chapter 20, I shall be with you on your wedding night. This is after the creature demands of Victor a companion so that the creature is no longer alone in the world. And Victor consents ultimately. And then Victor decides, no, he can't go through with it. And some of his arguments are rather weak indeed. He's afraid that they'll mate, for instance. Um, I suspect that a v Victor can create life from death and he could perhaps create a companion that wouldn't necessarily be fertile. Um, he also talks a little bit about what if the creature abandons um, or the creation abandons the, or, or the new creation abandons the creature. And 
Of course, notice how the creature is engaged in many of the same sins as Victor himself, although we can emphasize or empathize with the creature wanting companionship. There also is the question ultimately of the creature assuming that oh, a female should be created solely for its benefit and for its pleasure without any kind of consultation about the needs or the desires that the female um, new creation might have. So again, one of the parallels between Victor and the creature and one of the embedded messages, I think, that Mary Shelley is putting into her text about gender. But when the creature says on chapter 20, when he says he's going to enact his revenge and that he's going to basically uh, pursue Victor by torturing the people that he loves, um, the creature says, I shall be with you on your wedding night. And Victor, full of arrogance, full of hubris, assumes what that means is that Victor himself is going to be the target. Never once does Victor think that it could be Elizabeth or Chlorophyll or any of the other people that Victor cares about. And of course, the best way to hurt somebody is to hurt the people that they love. The creature has learned this quite well from observing humanity. So, we know that ultimately the creature kills Elizabeth. We know that ultimately the creature kills Clerval. Again, I hope I'm not um, giving you spoilers at this point. And we know that ultimately we get the return back to the epistolary narrative, the return to Walton. And what I find to be quite interesting that it is as late as chapter 24 when Victor is talking to Walton's mutinous crew. Remember, Walton is trying to pursue passageway, an undiscovered passageway, and um, the situation is dire. They're cold, they're hungry. Um, and what Victor says to Walton's crew, which is on the verge of, of mutiny, is be men or be more than men. Be steady to your purpose and firm as a rock. This is a direct contradiction to what Victor said at the beginning of the novel, where he was telling Walton that he wanted to um, relate his tale to Walton so that Walton wouldn't engage in the same errors. And yet in chapter 24, Victor is encouraging the crew to continue despite the danger dangers despite the hardships despite his own experiences with hubris the creature in chapter 24 talks about how impotent envy and bitter indignation filled me with an insatiable thirst for vengeance i was the slave not the master of an impulse which i detested yet could not disobey the idea of servitude and mastery and having one's emotions or one's ambitions um, take the place of reason and rationality is something that's embedded within this and many other Gothic texts. Um, by the ending, we know that uh, Victor dies. Um, and notice how often Victor is feverish. He's ill. He faints. Um, again, the consequences of his um actions and the creature unlike hollywood and it was a, a hollywood rule at the time in effect that the monstrosity would be vanquished and order would be established in this instance the creature does feel a certain level of regret the fact that the creature and his creator have been involved in a kind of cat and mouse game as they've been chasing each other over the ice now that victor no longer exists the creature doesn't necessarily have a purpose for existing again think about modern day parallels of a love hate relationship between a parent and a child that as much as they dislike or even detest one another they need one another as well and without that connection and no matter um, how toxic that connection may be there really is no purpose anymore the creature indicates that he's going to commit suicide. I shall collect my funeral pile and consume to ashes this miserable frame. Now, we don't know if he follows through with that or not. It's a wonderful opening for a sequel. Um, but we assume that he will, and that's going to be the ending of this cautionary tale, um, with Walton deciding to turn back. And uh, if there's any kind of happy ending, it's a, certainly not Victor's story, it's Walton's story that perhaps he has been able to avoid some of the misery that 
Victor experienced. And the cautionary tale ultimately is for us and not to allow extremes of ambition or emotion to get in the way of reason. You probably noticed the extremes of weather in this text. I had talked a little bit about how Percy Shelley, Mary Shelley's husband, had encouraged her to expand the text. She oftentimes did so by adding in these long nature passages, which would have been a common technique during the Romantic period to describe the natural world and its beauty and its ability to inspire. And note that when Victor and the creature are in the natural world, they are much more mentally stable and much happier. It's only when they isolate themselves from others, which is a, a major Gothic theme, is that isolation is always a bad thing in the world of the Gothic. But even the extremes of weather, take the ice, for instance, or fire, since he's going to consume himself to ashes. Again, the message within the text is about moderation and balance, which is a message that oftentimes is found in many pieces of great literature. And while perhaps Frankenstein isn't considered to be one of those great pieces of canonical literature in the way Shakespeare is, I would argue that Frankenstein and the text we're going to be reading this semester in one way or another have literary merit. And certainly we've been viewing them from the lens of the Gothic, but there are lots of other ways to view these particular texts as well. So I've just giving you a bit of an idea of how you could view it from a feminist perspective. And that said, I'm hoping that you're thinking about your first paper. As you know, I have a rolling deadline. I've indicated our due date as being mid-semester, which would be the 23rd of October, um, which would have given us a chance to read several Gothic texts. Um, but you are encouraged to begin now. And in fact, next class, after I put some closure onto Frankenstein, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the conventions of writing the critical paper, not the research paper, the critical paper. Hopefully that'll be a bit of a review for you. So you're at the point in the semester where you can hand in a paper at any time. You might be wanting to devote your first paper to Frankenstein, but of course Poe is another option and so is Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. Perhaps even Dracula, but by the time we get to Dracula, which is after Jekyll and Hyde, um, Probably it would be too late to really uh, devote a first paper analysis. Dracula might be better for a second paper, but there is some flexibility because Dracula straddles the two. And by critical paper, I mean that you aren't using outside resources, that you're using your own interpretations and what you've learned in this class from um, class videos and from discussion form responses. Uh, approximately four to five pages, double space, one inch margins. But as we will talk about next class, the paper should be as long as it needs to be for you to um, support your particular thesis. Um, whether you decide to discuss how the Emily Dickinson quote might be related to one of the Gothic texts, or as I had indicated, you can create your own topic. Just make sure that you have it approved by me. So again, those that the paper instruction seat is in syllabus and other documents folder. You can see this in the second section of the notes below where you could just click on that and you'll see that. Next class, I'll be adding information about the critical paper as well. So for our attendance question, which would be due Wednesday the 25th, is I had indicated about our epistolary novel technique, which is something that we're going to see in other Gothic texts that are upcoming in the semester, by the way. But the question being, did you like or dislike Shelley's use of the epistolary novel technique? And more importantly, why? So again, no right or wrong answer to this particular question. I'm more interested in your reasoning and um, you're certainly encouraged to respond to your classmates, not required though, but you are required to read your classmates' responses. You are required to read my responses in turn, give you a good idea of what the second half of this class would have been like if we were meeting in a face-to-face -face situation where we would have had a class discussion about the construction of the novel, the epistolary novel technique. 
So um, at this point, I think I'll, I'll leave it here so that we can finish up with Frankenstein next class and begin talking about some specifics of constructing a paper. I hope you are doing well. I'm doing well, and we will continue on next class. Take care. Bye-bye.